Let's talk. Well, 
But when we tested the app on all the devices in the night before, it was kind of slow. You could feel how it was not as smooth as on the newer devices. So we went to the code and we looked and we found out that at some point the prototype, you know, we start with a prototype all the time, but at some point the prototype gets to be the actual app, right? So this was the case. So we had to refactor this and we found out that every page on the app, for example on the garbage, uh, there was only a single container at the root level of the component tree. Okay, um, so we found two problems here. One is maintenance. It was really difficult to get, well not difficult, but it was super huge, the, um, the connected creator to get all the data from the store and propagate all that data through the tree. So that's, that's the first issue. And the second issue is uh, because the connect is at the root level, whenever any data or any update on the, on the store it is uh, happening, then all the tree, all the tree is getting updated. Like uh, because we were propagating all the properties to uh, the, the children. So on the newer devices, this doesn't make much difference. Um, you could run the app, you could. However, when you try the app on all the devices, you could see the difference. Um, so what we did instead, we started factoring the, the, the code, and we created smaller containers. So just by doing this little change, um, the app is running smooth on the older devices. Okay, because in this way, when the data get up there at this level, and here it will only render the branch, as opposed to rendering all the tree over and over again. There are, um, the rendering is one of the most expensive uh, process in the, in the app. Um, another thing that we found is, uh, I would recommend you to avoid spreading the props to the children. Like in this code, this looks really cool, right? Uh, you're spreading all the all the objects, all the properties into the children. So it looks clean, it looks it looks simple. However, at some point your application is going to start growing. You're gonna be adding more features to your app, you're gonna probably remove some features, it's all gonna change, right? So at some point you don't you're going to forget what properties are getting into the children. Probably some, you're adding a new property and that property is not necessary or is not needed on the children, but because you're spreading all the objects in the, all the properties in the object, everything is getting uh, passed to the children. So again, what I would recommend to do is just define whatever you need, all the properties that you need, that's the only property that you need to Find to send to the component. This way, you will avoid re render again the component uh, whenever properly all the properties get updated. Okay, so uh, just by doing this, we gain a few milliseconds on performance. Um, another thing that I would recommend you to do is do not access the Redux state directly. And what I mean by this, you will see a lot of online tutorials and. Uh, a lot of training, on a training, and you, you're gonna see this kind of code, kind of right? Um, when you connect your component with the Redux store, you will do, or you will use a connected creator, you get the state, and then you can access the state in your, in your container. However, um, when your app uh, start getting more and more bigger, start growing, then at some point you're going to need to refactor or to update your store, right? And it's going to be a little bit difficult to replace all those places and, and to update all those uh, decorators whenever you have to update uh, your store, okay? Whenever you have to refactor or add a new thing. Uh, so instead of doing this, what I would recommend you is to use a selector, okay? So in this way, you're going to be accessing the store, the Windows store, in a single place. And then whenever you're going to get the name in this case, uh, you can call 
the selector everywhere else. And you can, um, yeah, for the previous example, it was really simple, right? You were just accessing an existing data. However, there are cases where you need to calculate, do some processing for your data in order to render that, uh, the result. Such as in this case, um, so here I'm just um, calculating the total price uh, of all the products. Um, so for this, I would recommend you to use uh, Resolec. Um, everyone is familiar with this library. Well, Resolec, what it's going to allow you to do is create a selector. Uh, you will send two parameters. You will send the dependencies, if you have any. Uh, and then you will send a function, which is this, this is not a function. And, and in there, you will define your logic for your processing. Okay, so um, if you call the selector the first time, then it's going to run your whole processing here. Okay, and it's going to get the, the result. But the next time you call the selector, if they put it exactly the same, the input didn't change, then instead of running everything again, it, it will just get you back the previous result. So in this case, you're going to save a few milliseconds in here, uh, and then you're going to uh, retrieve the previous value. Okay? Um, whenever any of the dependencies change, in this case, I only define one single dependency, the products, which that's another selector, it could be another selector. Uh, you can define as many, as many dependencies as you, as you need. And whenever any of those dependencies get updated on the regular password, then your function is going to be executed again. Okay? I've seen so many, so many questions on Stack Overflow, on, Star Over on how, to, um, how to make a fetch request to a server, how to get data from, from an API. What I would recommend you to do is get a, use a middleware. Everyone is familiar with middleware? Yes? I'm asking you if it's not. Well, in a simple words, a middleware is just a function that gets executed every time uh, you dispatch an action. Okay? So you can intercept the action and do whatever you need. For example, in this case, we can use a middleware uh, to intercept this action and then create and handle all the logic for your fetch uh, request to the server. And the action looks really cool like this. Okay, and here we just define an object, promise, call it promise, you can call it whatever you want. And we can send all the parameters that we need to make the actual fetch request. In this case, I only define the URL, but we can define uh, parameters, we can define the body, and we can define headers, anything we need. Okay, and I also define types in there, which is an array. Uh, it has set three action names. So the first action name is going to be dispatched by the middleware automatically whenever, uh, just before the fetch is uh, sent to the server. So in this case, if you would like to show a loading animation or something, you will use that, um, that action. And if the server responds, uh, successfully, uh, the second action line is going to be dispatched. If there's any error, uh, such as the server respond with a 500 error or 404 or annular error, then the fail action is going to be dispatched by the middleware. And the middleware will look something like this. This is quite simple, but this is like the main logic. Okay, just get the, get the actions at the top and then I'm assuming here, like client, uh, have a, it's, it's an object that contains a request, um, a method that accepts all the parameters, and it will handle all the logic for that. You can you can use Ajax or Fetch or any other library that, that you need in here. Um, so it becomes a promise, and uh, you can append a then. And on the then, in here, as you can see from this line, there is a dispatch of the with the server response. Okay, and if there's an error, there's a catch, and the middleware is dispatching all of this for you. So in this way, your actions, um, you can have as many actions like this one, and all the, all the uh, logic for doing the actual call to the server is going to look like this. Okay? Uh, so this allows you to have uh, the JavaScript bundle smaller, therefore 
when the user gets um, for the first time to your website or to your app, she's going to download faster. Uh, CSS. Uh, there's a lot to talk about CSS. I don't, I don't have the time. Uh, but I just want to talk like uh, you should label CSS models, right? Why? Um, in web finding, it's super easy to do it. Uh, but it solves the problem um, that we all know. You know, when you're defining a class, right? And then you have some styles, you add it to the, to the DOM or to the component. And then someone else goes there and use the same class to other component. And then later, a few months later, someone updates. And then there are a lot of inconsistency on the CSS, right? And some the styles get overridden by, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that's difficult. We don't, we don't need that. What I would recommend you to do to avoid this problem is just to enable the, CSS, the modules on the CSS loader. Um, this is an example of the webpack configuration for the CSS loader. And as you can see, it's really easy. All you have to do is enable modules true. And then, this is super nice feature for the CSS uh, loader because it allows you to define dynamically, dynamically defined class names for your components. And as you can see here, there's a pattern. Um, the name of the classes are going to be uh, the path of the file where your component is located, and the name of the file, and finally the local name that you assign to the class. I'll show you an example. Um, let's say we have these styles, name and title, right? Those are very common names. Any, anyone, like, if I'm working on a team with 20 developers, it's very likely that someone else is going to name their classes with these names, unless you define some sort of pattern or something. But anyway, uh, if we're going to use the, the styles, what we have to do is import the styles into our component, as in the line number two, and then we, need to, we can use it like this, right here. The styles are going to be an object that is going to contain all the, all the keys. Uh, it's going to be an object with the keys name and title, but it, it's going to have something like this. As you can see, it contains the whole path to your component, and then the body, which is the, uh, the local name. Okay, so this will uh, is going to allow you um, to make sure that the, the, the styles are going to be unique to this, uh, to this component. You're not going to have um, the class name. You're not going to collide even though you define your title or your name uh, everywhere. Okay. Um, yeah, another thing, import single component components. There are many packages um, from the that we can use, for example, Lodash or something else. Uh, and usually this package allows you to import uh, or export everything, and then you can get the panel with in this example, you're actually importing all the components and you just gave the panel. What I recommend you to do instead of doing that, you should define exactly where your component is. So when Webpack do the build, it's you know, only going to get the component that you're using as opposed to everything. And this is going to make your bundle smaller, and therefore, it's gonna be, uh, you're going to download the, the the model faster, yeah, okay. um, The same goes for actions and selectors. Instead of using, um, instead of putting everything in the actions object or selectors object, um, you should only pour what you need, okay? Uh, the first feature here is um, you don't know for sure what are you using on that component, okay? If you're putting everything. Uh, therefore, if you want to remove an action or want to do something else, then it's going to be difficult to keep track of what you're using. Instead, you should import only the actions that you need, okay? Um, or the selectors that you need on your, on your components. And, and in this case, uh, when Webpack builds your JavaScript, uh, you're going to use whatever you are importing. So I think get to the 20 minutes uh, limit. <laughs> um, 
questions? Yeah. Oh, oh by the way, I'm, I'm giving away a few books to whoever has questions. So we have like two questions. So, uh, uh, would you say a lot of that applies to React Native or no? Um, some of this thing, yes. Like, for example, uh, importing the, the actions and the selectors in a way that is going to be easy to maintain. Um, and you're going to have a smaller bundle. But since the bundle is already included on your, on your build, when React Native, you know, when you do the, the React Native build, you're going to be included there. So when React Native, when you're working with React Native, you don't need to worry a lot about the downloads um, of the bundle. So some of these things apply to React Native, some of this doesn't. Um, you said that you did this for older phones. Um, did, did you find any measurable speed for newer phones too? When After you implemented all these changes, you said that you did this for older phones. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I I don't have the I don't have the time uh, to improve it. We definitely see um, improvement on the response time. You know, when you tap a button or when you keep scrolling on older phones, uh, for some reason it was taking longer. Right, like that you will notice the a few milliseconds, and after implementing some of these techniques, some of, some of these steps, um, we were able to use the app in a better, a better way. Mm -hmm. I don't have the right times right now, but definitely we we measure all that. I think I think we'll uh, for the sake of time we're gonna stop with the questions, but. First of all, thanks, Crystal, so much. Um, we're going to take a short 10 minute break. Uh, we'll see you back in 735, so like bathroom, mingling, uh, maybe there's some water left. See you soon.